بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله أما بعد. Today we're going to summarize in hopefully 10-15 minutes the fiqh of zakah. Just enough information for us to make a brief calculation. Now no doubt such a topic requires much more time and energy and each one of you is responsible for figuring out uh, that which is not mentioned on the flyer. You have exceptional circumstances. I am here, there are other scholars as well in the city. It is your job to find out and inshallah we will help out as much as possible. Now what exactly is zakah? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislate zakah? Of course zakah is one of the most important requirements of our religion and in over over 30 verses in the Quran, Allah pairs together salah and zakah. And Allah describes the believers as, as those who pray and give zakah. And so zakat is second only to salah in Islam. الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ Right? So iqamat is salah and ita is zakah is paired together in over 35 verses in the Quran. And we all know what happened at the time of Abu Bakr when a group of new Muslims decided they, want to pay, they don't want to pay zakah. That Umar ibn al-Khattab and others, they said these people cannot be Muslim because they have denied the zakah. And so anybody who denies the zakah, anybody who does not pay the zakah thinking there's no right in his money for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person simply cannot be a Muslim. Now there are many wisdoms of legislating zakah. Of the primary wisdoms of legislating zakah is to eliminate greed from our hearts. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to give in order to force us to be generous to others. And of the wisdoms of zakah is that zakah purifies our money. And that's what zakat means. Literally, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا زَكَّا Zakat means to purify, to cleanse. So, anybody who does not pay zakat, his money is najis and filthy in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that person will be feeding his family najasa. If you do not give zakah, your money is filthy in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you pay zakah, this purifies your money. And of course, zakah is one of the greatest signs of iman. Zakat is one of the greatest signs of iman. Why? Because when you give your money, when you give your money, there must be something you get back in return. No, none of us just gives money and then expects nothing back. And therefore, when we give money for Allah and we don't get anything back that we see, this shows us that we fully believe that we are going to get something back even if we don't see it. We have Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why one of the most interesting terms of zakat is sadaqa. And sadaqa comes from sidq or to say the truth. And the reason why sadaqa means to give your charity for the sake of Allah is because when you give your money, you are saying, Oh Allah, I believe you to be true. Sadaqa. Sadaqa Allahul Azim. Sadaqa. Oh Allah, I believe your promise to be true. That I'm giving money and I don't see what I'm getting back, but I have full yaqeen that my hundred, my thousand, my ten thousand, you will give me back much better than this. Where do I get this from? This is sadaqa. Sadaqa Allah. Allah has spoken the truth and the Prophet has spoken the truth. So when you give your zakah, you are showing your sidq and therefore from sidq we get sadaqa. So therefore zakat has many wisdoms and many benefits for us in this world and the next. Now who gives zakah? By unanimous consensus it is obligatory on all adult Muslims who have more than the nisab which is the minimum amount for a Islamic year. So adult Muslim, of course by adult we mean sane and, and the regular conditions apply here, who has more than the nisab for over a year. There's a little bit of a controversy over zakat of children's money. So for example, for example, suppose somebody has gifted your child, suppose a grandfather or an uncle has said, here's $50,000 for my nephew, my niece, when they grow up, this is for their college. Let's give an example, right? So. Who is the owner of this money is the child. Now obviously if you gave it, this is separate, but if a child owns it, now you're not the owner. So if the child owns the money, is there zakat on the child's money? Little bit of a controversy here. The Hanafi school of law says that no, there will not be zakat until the child becomes baligh, until that is 15 or 16. And the other three schools of law say, so the, 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 the money will be liable for zakah and the guardian of the child must give. Because for the other three schools they say zakat is also haq for society, not just haq for the Muslim. 
It's haq for society. So this kid has $50,000 in his account for his college fund. But according to the three madhahib, society also has a right on that money. Fuqara have a right on that money. Right? So according to the other three schools of law, therefore they would say the wali or the guardian of the child will give zakat on the uh, zakat uh, on the money of the child. And the Hanafi school says because it's a child, so the child you don't ask him to pray necessarily, you don't do this and that. So they would say uh, that this is not a requirement and this is one of the many differences in the fiqh of uh, zakat. What do we give zakat on? What do we give zakat on? Well, there are four types of wealth that zakat is liable for, and we're only going to discuss two of them, and two we will leave. The two that we will leave are agricultural produce and livestock. We're not going to talk about that. Anybody who's a farmer, come see me. I'll look up the books of fiqh for you. I haven't memorized that for 20 years. But if you're a farmer, or you have a lot of produce or land, uh, or you have a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 if you have a lot of animals, for example, uh, then we have to look up your zakat. Otherwise, we will leave it for the purposes of this short khatira. So what are the two categories of zakat that are very prevalent in our community? Number one, money. And by money, we mean gold and silver and cash. And number two, business commodities. Now, business commodities is only for those who are in the market buying and selling things other than money. For those of you who go to a job nine to five, you work for a corporation, you don't have a business, you don't have a franchise, you don't have a, a, a furniture store, you don't have a gas station. For those people, they don't even have to worry about that. Only those who are buying and selling, they have to worry about the second category. For for the majority of American Muslims, we work for a company, we work for a corporation, we get a salary, and we're not really dabbling in business uh, produce or, the, or business issues, so we only have to worry about the first category. But I'll briefly summarize the second category as well. So the first category is what? Money, gold, and silver, and cash. Now, what is the minimum amount that is the nisab? Scholars have pretty much unanimously agreed it's 20 dinars of gold and 200 dirhams of silver. Once upon a time, 20 dinars of gold equal 200, dinars, uh, 200 dirhams of silver. Dinar literally means gold, dirham means silver. So once upon a time, one gold coin equal 10 silver coins. Obviously that time has long gone, right? These days gold is... I think 70 times more expensive or something than silver. Nonetheless, scholars have tried to calculate and extrapolate. So there's a little bit of a small spectrum of opinion. How much is 20 dinars? Some say 84, some say 87, some say 85. I just put in your handout 85 grams of gold, which is pretty much a majority position. 85 grams of gold is one nisab. 595 grams of silver is another nisab. And in our modern times, uh, if you look at the, the, the charts, it fluctuates on a daily basis. So uh, the nisab of, of gold is going to be a around 3,900 something if you calculate it uh, this month. And the Nisab of silver is going to be around 400 something uh, uh, dollars. Uh, the point being though, that anybody who has more than $4,000 in a year must give zakat. And pretty much every one of us who is middle class or even lower middle class, we have more than three $4,000 uh, for the year. How about if I have a debt? How about if I owe somebody money or somebody owes me money? So I took a loan of $10,000 or Somebody took a loan from me for $10,000. What do I do? So very simply, if you owe somebody money, and now listen carefully, number one, it is a short-term investment, short-term debt. He wants it back, right? In this case, you will deduct this amount from your total assets. So. I owe somebody $30,000. I calculate how much money I have in the bank and everything, it comes out to be 70,000. I will deduct 30,000 from 70,000 to give 40 and I will give zakat on 40,000. Because I owe somebody that much, it's not my money. right? This is if the debt is immediate, means he wants it back. If the debt is long term, so somebody's given you money and he's not Begging, he's not asking you. And the classic example here is the mortgage on our houses. Let's not get into the issue of whether mortgage is halal or haram. It is a debt. You owe two hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars, right? This is a long-term debt. You do not deduct long-term debts from current assets because if you were to do this, all of us are bankrupt, right? You do not deduct long-term debts from current assets. Long-term is understood. Okay, he doesn't want his money back now. He's not asking for it. It's understood to be paid back over uh, 30 or 40 years. So short-term debts that you owe, you will deduct from your assets. Long-term debts you do not uh, deduct. How about if somebody owes me money? 
So I gave somebody a, a loan of $10,000. Once again, now we look at his situation and scenario. Situation number one, he has the money. And you know it because you gave him before med school, mashallah, tabarakallah, and now he's a millionaire, mashallah, right? But he's your cousin, he's your friend, you don't need the 10,000 anymore, right? Or, uh, and so you're like, okay, whenever I need it, I'll ask you. So the only reason you don't have it in your bank account is because you didn't ask him. But it is in his bank account, and you know this from his lifestyle. In this case, you will consider that 10,000 to be in, in your possession because you're just not asking him, but he has it. So you will consider this to be in your possession. So you will give zakat on it because it is fi hukm al mawjud. It is the it is in existence except that you just simply haven't asked him. However, if the person does not have the finances to give you back this zakat, this money, and you don't know when uh, he will give it back to you, he's still struggling. You you gave him thirty thousand to start his own business. This is a loan, not a business partnership. This is a loan. You gave him thirty thousand as a loan to start his own business. Now he's struggling. You don't know. So in this case that 30,000 does not exist for zakat purposes. So you simply ignore that and it does not exist. When he gives you back, then you figure out what to do with that, eh? with that zakat. Another issue of zakat, which is one of the biggest controversies of uh, the fuqaha of the old, is women's jewelry. Women and their problems, mashallah, tabarakallah, we fuqaha have a lot of discussions of them, right? Women's jewelry, right? And there's a classic controversy, do we give zakat on the gold and silver of women? By the way, you can breathe a sigh of relief. All precious stones other than gold and silver that are women's jewelries are not zakatable, right? So husbands, maybe you should think of the diamond necklaces and the, and the, and the pearls and whatnot. This might be easier for the, zakat, for the zakat issues, right? So precious stones that are not gold and silver that are jewelry. We're not talking about somebody who's in this precious stones business. We're talking about most of us here. The jewelry is our women's decoration pieces. For that, only gold and silver is a controversy. And once again, we have two of the madahib on one side, two on the other side. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but in my humble opinion, the ahadith seem to be very clear in this regard, that gold and silver, however it exists, is zakatable. Gold and silver, however it exists. Because once the Prophet saw a woman wearing gold jewelry, and, she, and he asked her, do you give zakat on these bangles? She said no. So the Prophet said, do you want to wear bracelets made out of fire? She said no. So then he said, give zakat. So the point being, it seems very clear, and Allah knows best, but this is, two of the madahib say this, and there's a controversy over this, do they give zakat or not? But in my humble opinion, in the opinion of my teachers as well, zakat is given on women's gold and silver, but not on women's other jewelry, such as precious stones, it's only on zakat and uh, silver. Um, the other issue that uh, comes of zakat is, Investments, investments. Now, most of us, most of us don't dabble in uh, business uh, commodities, except for those who are businessmen. For those who have nine to five jobs, we might have a little bit of an investment on the side. For example, a second house we rent out. For example, a land that we purchased and it's just lying there, right? For example, stocks that we might have. How about investments of this nature? Here. Scholars have again differed in modern times, but I'll give you what I believe to be the strongest position. We look at the niyyah, the intention of the one who has invested, i.e. in this case me and you. Let me give you an example of a land. You purchase an empty land, and it's just lying there. Now technically, technically this is a business investment. But if you don't intend to sell it anytime soon, it will not be classified as a business investment according to the Sharia. It will only be classified as a business investment when you put the sign, when you announce, Khalas, I'm accepting bids on this property. Then it will become a business investment, then you have to pay zakat, which is the second type of zakat. Another example is stocks and mutual funds. Okay, listen very carefully now. Stocks and mutual funds that you have, that you do not intend to sell anytime. Of, we're not talking about if a life-threatening emergency, everybody sells everything then. We're talking about your niya is, I have this set aside for when I'm old. We're getting to 401k, don't be impatient. 401k in a while. We're talking about stocks and mutual funds. Stocks and mutual funds, you have investment and you say, inshallah, you know, when my kid goes to college, I'll see if I need this money for his education. For now, I'm putting it aside. So because you're putting it aside, 
And it's not actual cash, it is an investment. And this is the difference. Had you kept it in the bank, it would be cash. And cash you have to pay zakat on. If you're investing in a company, you get a piece of paper that says you own this percentage, this is your number of stocks, your shares. This is not cash. You can check it, you can cash it in to get the cash, but it is not cash. So because it is not cash, and because you don't, you are not making it a business buying and selling opportunity in the immediate future, the correct position, insha'Allah ta'ala, there is no zakat on long-term stocks and mutual funds and lands. There's no zakat on long-term, which means what? Short-term. Short term would be for like, let's say the day traders. You know, there are people, they make their fortune or they make their money they, all day long. They're simply online looking for the stock to go one fourth percent. They'll sell it right there. You know, another stock goes down, they'll buy it and go this. This type of person is not the same as most of us who have long term mutual funds. For that person, his zakat will be category number two, which we're going to come to. That's business commodities, right? For that person, he is using the guy who's buying and selling houses is not the same as the guy who buys one house for the long term, right? The one whose business is to buy and sell houses, the one whose business is to buy and sell land, the one whose business is to buy and sell stocks, is not the same as the one who just buys stocks for the long term, or buys one land for the long term. For that category, the one long term, no zakat. For the short term, then they will, they will have zakat according to category two, which we will talk about. 401k, the big question, 401k. And the 401k, by the way, scholars of our times have had, wallahi, there's been a worldwide conference of the scholars of Rabat al-Alam al-Islami over 401ks, يعني, five, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. They got 50 scholars from around the globe to spend two weeks. This is a very, very tricky issue. And Sheikh Qardawi has a position and Fulan has a position. And there's a whole spectrum. I myself have spent a lot of time trying to see which position. The majority of scholars, and this is what the OIC or the Rabat has also said, which is one of the largest scholarly bodies of our time. The Rabbit al Adam and, and the, the, the majority of scholars have said 401ks are not zakatable until you cash them out, which is when you retire, right? Because they, they are in the uh, the hukum the of long term, not the hukum of short term. The ruling will be the long term. So 401ks you do not pay zakat on until you get the actual cash. When will you get the cash? When you are 65, 70, when you basically cash out your 401k, then you will give zakat on it. Until that time, it's really not, and the reason they say this, it's not your full property. You don't have what's called mulkiya, milkiya. You don't have control. Other people, your company, others, there's liabilities. You can't say, have a full say in it. So, bottom line, the strongest position, 401k, inshallah ta'ala, there is no zakat until you actually cash out on it. Okay, so what is left then? What is left? is the things that you own and you use and your bank account. By unanimous consensus, the wealth that is not cash but you use it, for example your house, your cars, your clothes, your shoes, these do not have any zakat on. By unanimous consensus of all of the madahib, the wealth that you physically use and you live in and you drive, there's no zakat on that. So therefore, for most of us, the bulk of our zakat will be in our cash, in our savings, in our jewelry. This will be for the most of us. And what do the scholars say? Again, to make a long story short, the, the, the scholars of our times, understanding that most of us live uh, by paychecks, like once upon a time paychecks were unheard of. You didn't know how much wealth you would get. You would get a big amount one year, you might got, not get anything for many years after that. Things were different back then. For us, the bulk of the world gets a paycheck, right? And it is almost impossible to figure out how much money we have in January versus February versus March versus April and then figure out what was the nisab of each month. It would drive the average person crazy even if they were an accountant. Most of us are not accountants. So, because of this, the fatwa that has been given by many scholars including Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin and the Rabbit and others to make things easy for the Muslims. Now this is technically, this is uh, I don't want to say it's not right, but it wouldn't have been thought of uh, 50 or 100 years ago. But to make things easy for the Muslims, and wallahi it makes sense. What these scholars have said is, every Muslim must choose one day of the year. And they're not allowed to change that day later on. They choose one day of the year, that is their zakat calculation day. And that day will be their lifelong day. 
20th of Ramadan, let's say. 25th of Ramadan, let's say. Right? Most Muslims like to do it in Ramadan, and wallah, it's a good, you get extra reward, why not? Obviously, it's got to be the Islamic calendar. Some Muslims make the mistake of saying the 1st of January. No, zakat is not due according to the Gregorian calendar. It's due according to Islamic calendar. You choose one day. Now, on that day, every single year, you assess what you have, and you pay zakat on that. Khalas. You don't have to keep a detailed account of what did I have in January, what did I have in February, what did I have in March, because most of us don't do it to that much detail. And it would be too much of a haraj, too much of a mashaqqa, too much of a difficulty to tell the average Muslim they have to keep track of every month and draw a chart out and see how much nisab. So the scholar said just to make things easy, one day of the year you calculate what do I have in my bank account, what do I have in the other wealth, what do I have in jewelry, and Allah knows your niyyah, you're not trying to trick that day. If it so happened that there was a major uh, catastrophe the last month, you had to spend $50,000, come that zakat date, you don't have the money. Allah knows, you didn't, you're not tricking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows your niyyah. The converse is also true. Suppose you got your bonus the 19th of Ramadan, and your, your company wrote you a check of let's say $20,000, mashallah. Or you were very successful in business, and you got the money into your cash account, right? Now that's in your cash account, well then this is, this is the, the flip side. That some, some years you'll give a little bit less, some years you'll give a little bit more, and that's the point. You're consistent with that day, inshallah that's perfectly fine. That's the whole point here. So, that's the simple way of giving zakat. There's a more complicated way which uh, I don't want to get into now, but this is what the, 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 the fatwa is from the majority of scholars, that for the average Muslim, they choose that one day, and they just calculate how much they have, and they give zakat on that. So for example, we have Brother Ahmed here, Let's say on Brother Ahmed's, uh, from what does he own? He owns uh, sixty. Uh, he 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 owns his car. He owns uh, two cars. He owns a house where he's paying off his mortgage of his house. He has so much money in the bank account. Let's say thirty thousand in cash, and he has two types of stocks. The first type is a short-term stock that he is interested. He's dabbling in buying and selling stocks, and he has seventy thousand in that. And the second is long-term stocks, which he doesn't intend to sell. Mutual funds, let's say thirty thousand. In this case, the thirty thousand long-term he. Does doesn't pay zakat on. The 70,000 short term that he's as a hobbyist, he's buying and selling online. Every week he's looking, every day he's looking. He must pay 2.5% of that 70,000. And then also the money in his bank account and the wife's jewelry. All of this will be uh, zakatable. And then as we said, there's no zakat on cars and houses. And of course, by the way, I mean understood here, a second house that you own and you rent out, you're not intending to sell it, you're renting it out. You will give zakat on the cash that comes from the rent and you put it into your bank account. When 20th Ramadan comes, how much cash do you have in the bank account? That's the zakat of the house. You do not give zakat on the cost of the second house. Unless you're in the business of buying and selling houses, as we get to, right? Because I hope that's very clear here. Now, that's the first category, that's wealth. The second category, business commodities. Business commodities are the commodities that a businessman, a trader, he buys and he sells. So, if you are a person who owns a furniture store, so you have furniture items in your store. You're a car salesman, you're the owner of the, uh, 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 of the car lot, right? You have 30 cars, 50 cars. Every day a car comes in, a car goes. Every day three cars here, five cars there. This is now business commodity. For the businessman, the, the, the form of that have are pretty much unanimous here. For the businessman, he must on that 20th of Ramadan, calculate the cost or the, uh, the, the amount, yeah the cost exactly, the cost of the merchandise that he owns on that day. And he will pay zakat on the cost of the merchandise, 2.5%. And the value of the merchandise, two point, the value of the merchandise. And again, Allah knows, perhaps the day before he was very lucky and he sold 50 cars. Well then he doesn't pay zakat on those because he doesn't own them. Right? Or the opposite, the day before, yani he had, didn't have any customers, so he has a surplus of 30, 40 cars that he typically would not have. Again, consistency. If every day or every year you have the same day, then Alhamdulillah you are forgiven in this regard. But the business owner, so the same applies for the, the one who owns a, a gas station, let's say, right? So that the, the owner of the gas station will just do a quick inventory, just to, obviously you don't have to count every single you know, bubblegum wrapper that you're selling, you get a rough idea. You give a rough idea, how much do I own right now? Uh, the, the gas that is in the gas station, you do not pay zakat by the way on that which you don't buy and sell. So the gas owner, he owns the, the gas uh, pump. You don't pay zakat on the gas pump. You pay zakat on the gas. You pay zakat on the merchandise. You don't pay zakat on the fridge because you're not buying and selling the fridge. 
right? You, you get the point here, right? The merchandise that you use in your store, you don't pay zakat on. Not the merchandise, excuse me. The, the utensils or the items that you use in the store, you don't pay zakat on. It's only the merchandise. This is urud al-tijara or the business uh, commodities, okay? So this is in brief uh, in terms of the second category that's business commodities. One final point, inshallah, then, we'll move, uh, then we will move on to the taraweeh. One final point, who do you give zakat to? There are eight categories mentioned in the Quran, but there's really only two that are relevant to, uh, to most of us, and that is faqir and miskin. Faqir and miskin. And what is the difference between faqir and miskin? The majority position is that faqir is somebody who does not have enough to live a normal life. Miskin is somebody who's struggling to live, but he might have some meager life. So he has a house, but it's too small for all of his children. He has a very old car. This is miskin. And remember we just mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf that the ship belonged to, to what? Miskin. The ship belonged to miskin. So they're struggling, they're eking out an existence. And, uh, there's, uh, and, and so you give to a person, now this is Again, there's a whole spectrum of opinion. I'll just g tell you what I think is the strongest position, and Allah knows best. Every culture, every society has a norm that they consider to be, it's okay to live up till this level. If you go beneath this level, this is poverty. And this changes from culture to culture. Let me give you an example. In America, if you don't have a fridge in your house, you are very, very poor. Whereas in some lands, to have a fridge is a luxury. Still to this day, by the way. In some lands, to have a fridge is a luxury. It's not something that is necessary, right? In America, in most cities, if you don't have some type of car to get around, then really you're struggling to live, right? If you don't have some type of car, even if it's an old car, you're struggling to live. There's a certain level that is understood that this is a level that beneath which you are considered to be living in difficult circumstances. Now, what this level is, is not a fine line, it's a little bit of common sense. You know, the Sharia does not come with fine lines, it's common sense here. Anybody, in my humble opinion, this is the position of the majority of scholars, by the way, anybody who is beneath this line of regular struggling, if you like, they're in the line of poverty, this person is mustahiq, he is uh, allowed to take zakat. And you may give this person enough zakat to make sure that they are taken care of. Some scholars have said for one year, some have said you can only give the nisab, which I do not agree with, because if you only give the nisab, you could only give $4,000. Sometimes a family of you know four or five children, $4,000 will last them three, four months. It's not going to be enough for them. In my humble opinion, this is the Shafi'i Madhav as well, you can give as much as they need. And this seems to be the strongest opinion. You can give them as much as they need. And it is recommended for each one of us to go find people who genuinely need the zakah. Not just to hand over to somebody, to find somebody who needs the zakah and hand it over to them. And you do not have to tell them that it is zakat. You just hand them the money and you just say this is a gift. You don't have to say it is zakat money. Uh, the issue of uh, not giving to people, descendants of the family of the Prophet is a true one. All of the madahib are in agreement that Somebody we call a Sayyid in our culture, Indian Pakistani culture calls it Sayyid, uh, and the Arabs call them Al al Bayt. We do not give to a Sayyid or an Al al Bayt. However, let me do point out here that, excuse me for saying this, but we in our culture, the Indian Pakistani culture, have a big problem of assuming everybody is a Sayyid when they're not a Sayyid, right? It is as if all the descendants of the process have migrated to Indian Pakistan, every second one of us is a Sayyid. The fact of the matter is, and I, let me be very blunt here, I am also Pakistani as you know, let me be blunt here. Somebody who says they're a Sayyid, doesn't make them a Sayyid. Somebody who says they're a Sayyid, doesn't make them a Sayyid. Everybody says they're a Sayyid back there. The fact of the matter, if a person is genuinely a descendant of the Prophet they would have a shajara, they would have a, uh, they would have a genealogy chart. And we know this from experience, from interacting with the people. The real descendants of the Al al-Bayt, the real descendants, they kept a shajara, they kept their lineage. Just because your grandmother told you you're a Sayyid, doesn't make you a Sayyid. So if somebody says, yeah, I think I'm a Sayyid, it doesn't make him, if, he, if he's mustahiq of zakah, you may give him zakah. And the final point here, inshallah, relevant to our MIC thing, is that what I recommend and advise, and I am doing this myself, inshallah, as well, just to tell that I fully believe in this, that divide your zakah into portions. One portion, you find the mustahiq yourself. Go to some relative, go to somebody, friend, and give them zakat. Another portion, you give over to get to people you don't have access to. I don't have access to the refugees in Syria, but I want to give them zakat. 
So what do you do then? Here comes in MIC. Alhamdulillah, as we said, we will take your zakat money and we have two projects that we're going to give to. And this was again, again, I'm, very, I'm a strong believer in this. One of them has to be local. I'm a strong believer in local projects. We need to find our own uh, mustahiq in this community and give them zakat. Many of us, we probably don't know uh, people or we, or we cannot find that many people for here in Memphis. We will take charge of that. There are people that are deserving of zakat. We will take charge of giving them zakat in Memphis. One portion will go to them. Another portion to the refugees and the lajiin in Syria and in, and, and, you know, Jordan and in Turkey, wherever they are, we will give it to them. And one portion, you guys find your own people, your families, your extended relatives. And as I said on the chart, you may give zakat to relatives as long as they're not ascendants and descendants and, and your wife, right? You cannot give to anybody above you. Mother, father, grandfather, grandmother. You cannot give to anybody below you. You cannot give to your spouse. You may give to a brother or a sister if they are mustahiq of zakat. You may give to a cousin or an uncle, and in fact, this is more rewarding as long as they are mustahiq of zakah. I know a lot of questions have been raised. Obviously, we don't have time to get into them, but alhamdulillah, I mean, I'm here. There are other scholars, alhamdulillah, in the community as well. Anytime you need, inshallah ta'ala, uh, you can come to me and ask me. And with this, inshallah, we will resume. Jazakumullahu khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.